Good afternoon. Welcome to the last program of the Dole Institute of Politics spring term programming. I think you'll see that this year we may have saved the best for last, and I thank all of you in Hanson Hall for your patience. I know it's, it's hard to participate in a program when you're in a separate room. Um, as many of you know, I'm a historian of American politics. We historians are terrible predictors of the future, so I can't tell you how many people in my profession will write positively about the, the, uh, the current administration in five years, and 10 years, and 50 years. But I do know that the circumstances under which President Obama and his staff assumed office were, well, extraordinary and truly historic by any measure. A free-falling economy, two wars, crises over prisoner rights and executive authority, the legacies of a generation of deregulation of industry and deferred maintenance on infrastructure. Let's compare that to, say, how either Bush, President Bush entered the White House, or even President Clinton, who inherited an economy already emerging from recession. Really, you have to go back to President Truman, who had to grapple with ending a world war and starting a cold one, or President Roosevelt, who took the helm of the economy and the country at the depth of the Great Depression to find more dire circumstances facing a new administration. The decisions that the president and his staff have made over the past 16 months have ranged from historic to inconsequential, from popular to not so popular. <laughs> what strikes me as an admittedly supportive observer is the sheer scope of the president's use of the powers of his office. At the center of his administration's creed is a belief that public service and government can and must help people. From this core idea comes many of the big decisions and policy shifts we've witnessed over a breathtaking year and a half. How do you alter the course of a nation? How does a new administration make its mark on foreign and domestic policy? How do we solve some of the very real problems facing our country when there are powerful forces rooting for us to fail? These are some of the questions that face today's guest on a daily basis. As Deputy Chief of Staff to the President, Mona Sutphin is, as, is close to the Oval Office in more ways than one. Her own office is literally steps away from the President's center of operations. She's also part of his inner circle of advisors on policy matters. For years, she has worked alongside the most influential members of the foreign policy establishment, yet, as a Washington Post profile put it last year, as a respected foreign policy thinker in a job coordinating President Obama's vast domestic policy agenda, Mona Sutphin embodies the way the current administration blurs the line between the two, believing that issues such as public education, regulatory reform, and economic recovery no longer stop at the water's edge. I think this is significant. So are the experiences Sutphin brings to the table at the West Wing. Her parents met close to here in Kansas City, Missouri in the early 60s when interracial marriage was still illegal. Her white Jewish mother and African-American father drove across the state line during their lunch hour to Kansas for a clandestine wedding ceremony. <laughs> Later, the family moved to Milwaukee, where Ms. Sutphin's mother was a legal secretary in the, state, in the state public defender's office, and her father worked for the National Labor Relations Board. One of only three in her high school class to go to college out of state, Ms. Sutphin went to Mount Holyoke College in Western Massachusetts. By her senior year, she was working as a research assistant to Anthony Lake, a professor of international relations who later served as President Clinton's first national security advisor. After college, she headed for the U.S. Embassy in Thailand, where, to our great fortune here at the Dole Institute, she served with one of our great friends, Ambassador David Lambertson. Thanks, David, for helping us put this program together. In Bangkok, she managed the human rights portfolio for Burma, then went on to an assignment helping implement the Dayton Peace Accords, which ended the war in Bosnia. She then did a stint in the Clinton administration as a special assistant to National Security Advisor Sandy Berger. How's this for a political insider? She met her husband, Clyde Williams, in the White House Situation Room. <laughs> Not the cheesy Wolf Blitzer set on CNN. <laughs> the real Situation Room. After her work at the White House, she worked in New York City for the Clinton Foundation and then at the Stonebridge International Business Consulting Firm. She's also author of an influential book, The Next American Century, How the U.S. Can Rise While Others Thrive, which one reviewer commented recognizes that national security begins at home with education, health care, infrastructure. Sounds a lot like what we heard from a young state senator from Illinois. Uh, and Tony Lake and Susan Rice, now the UN ambassador, brought Sutphin onto the foreign policy core group of the Obama campaign early. She was a key member of the Obama-Biden presidential trans transition, and she later joined the new administration in her cur current post, where like her boss, Rahm Emanuel, her previous White House experience gives her a keen sense of executive branch intangibles, like the importance of setting the right pace for devising and pushing new policy and how to manage the complexity of interagency politics. Interviewing the Deputy Chief this afternoon is the man who's been my boss for the past six years at the Dole Institute. I can't imagine a better one. I have one other boss at this place, and it happens 
that we received a message from him earlier today. Please welcome Mona on my behalf, wrote Bob Dole. I really appreciate her visiting the University of Kansas, and particularly the Dole Institute of Politics. Let her know I will try to be helpful when I can. So you heard it here first. <laughs> Please welcome to the Dole Institute Deputy Chief of Staff, Mona Sutphin. Mona, we know how busy you are. We really appreciate your time today. Um, what attracted you to public service? What got you involved in the first place? You know, it's, it's interesting, because I don't know that I consciously ever thought that I would be go into public service growing up, or even necessarily in college. But I, when I look back on it, I actually think it was the fact that my parents were both active. Um, they both worked for government, but they also were really active in their community, involved in the community organizations. Um, involved in training workers, and they were always uh, involved in local politics, um, helping with aldermen elections and local judges races and that kind of thing. And so we kind of always had this family this, uh, that was involved in activities in the community. And I think the subtext was that just continued on. So. Uh, the issues that, I, that interested me in college. I ended up getting involved in international affairs really early, but I really wanted to see the world. And um, I had this defining moment when I, I um, graduated from college and I worked for an advertising agency in Chicago, Leo Burnett. And I was sitting there one night and I thought to myself, here I am, it's two o'clock in the morning and I'm worried about sales of Pert Plus shampoo. <laughs> and I thought, you know, if I'm gonna work till two o'clock in the morning, Maybe it should be for something related to world peace or something like that. And that was kind of a defining um, shift in my thinking. And though I had already kind of dabbled, I'd taken a foreign service exam, I thought about going into government, the next opportunity that arose to jump into government, I took it, even though I didn't know exactly where that would take me in my career. So, What would you say, uh, up to your current role, and we'll talk about that more in a few minutes, but what would you say your, your most meaningful or most satisfying job has been? Oh, that's a hard one. I'd say my most satisfying job up until this one, mm -hmm, I think in a way right. this one is the most satisfying, but um, before that um, was when I worked in Sarajevo um, right after the war. Uh, there was a moment, uh, I got there soon after they had signed the Dayton Peace Accords, and um, in the springtime we were working on a variety of issues dealing with uh, prisoners of war who were left over from the war, and we got ended up in a deep negotiation with the parties for a multi-swap agreement of uh, people who had been held, who had been picked up during the war and held as human, um, uh, held as for ransom basically among the sides during the war. And um, I remember there was a late night and we drove our cars out to this middle of the road, dark of night, and two other cars drove up with buses behind them and we had this exchange of prisoners so that people could go back to their families. And I never, I remember thinking to myself, I feel incredibly proud that we were able to pull this off and that people can get back to their families. I had a level of satisfaction in my job that I don't think that I've had because you see the, somebody who's been you know, held in very difficult circumstances for in some cases many years being reunited with their families. It's a very powerful moment and to feel that you could contribute to that in little, some little small way was really compelling. Describe your current job at the White House. You're the Deputy Chief of Staff, but what specific portfolio of responsibilities do you carry? So, uh, I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy, um, and I'd say I work on a, on a range of issues, as we all do in the Chief of Staff's office. I'd say we're dealing with um, almost every kind of issue that comes across the transom, if it's ultimately coming to, to this level, to the uh, Chief of Staff or to the President. Um, and it's mainly domestic policy. I do some foreign policy work still, still, but it's everything from questions of education policy. Right now I'm involved in some of the issues associated with the regulatory framework um, related to the oil spill and um, oversight and that kind of thing related to that. I might be um, working on Guantanamo related issues and the proper role of what we're gonna do both prospectively and retrospectively with, um, with Gitmo. Um, it's just a range of different issues, sometimes housing policy, small business, we have a piece of small business legislation we're trying to move. So it's a really diverse mix of issues. Um, a lot of it is regulatory. I work on a lot of issues related to um, the other agencies and what their priorities are and working through. Typically we get issues when they're kind of uh, either very complicated and messy or there's a big dispute. And so we're working to try to resolve them 
advance the president's agenda, make sure that we're working through what all the different challenges are to try to get it to a good good solution. A lot of it is cleanup of, of problems and dealing with unforeseen issues, and some a lot of it is affirmative, trying to push uh, the agenda that we're trying to pursue. How did you get to know the president? Well, how did you meet and how did you get involved in his campaign? Um, you know, I first heard about him uh, from a friend of mine who I had worked with in the Clinton administration who was a speechwriter for Madeleine Albright. And he called me one day out of the blue and said, there's this guy, Barack Obama, who's running for Senate in, uh, in Illinois, and I think I'm going to quit my job. He worked for the MacArthur Foundation and go work for him. And, I, and he said, what do you think? And I said, is this the Barack Obama who lost to Bobby Rush by a bunch of points? And he said, yeah. And I said, what? are you insane? Why would you do that? That makes no sense at all whatsoever. And he, and he said, well, I really, he's so compelling. I really think he can win. And I said, his name's Barack Obama. What more do you need to know he can't win? Um, but he went on to quit his job, and he went worked for him for a while. And I remember that's the first I had ever heard of him. Then I met him soon after he won. He, he was in Washington, and he was doing a series of kind of getting to know you events. Uh, and for a variety of different reasons, he ended up hiring a fair number of people who had worked for Tom Daschle. Uh, and we were close to the Daschle operation. And so we knew a lot of people in common. I remember going to a couple of events people would have in their living room, and he would do kind of a Q&A, similar to the events that he would do on the campaign. But it was really a getting to know you, really understanding where he was coming from. And I remember even then thinking, you know what, he's, he's, he's really compelling, very smart. Um, really thoughtful, and I thought um, he is uh, speaking to the issues that are really on my mind, almost one for one, and I had not really encountered that uh, when it came to dealing with politicians up until that point. Um, and then later, I'm sure you'll ask me about the campaign, but yeah, so that was my first interaction with him. So very kind of, you know, informal kind of chatting, but not, not anything particularly serious, and I certainly didn't think he was going to run for president. So. Mm -hmm. What was your role on the campaign? So on the campaign, I ended up getting involved on, um, we had a foreign policy kind of core group, um, which was at the beginning maybe 12 of us. And um, when we first heard that he was thinking about running, I, I thought, I can't believe he's actually going to run for president. But I very quickly, and people, because I had worked for the Clinton administration, many people thought that I would, I would support um, Hillary, and I, who, who I think is fantastic and I deeply respect. So I was... Um, definitely torn, but on the other hand, I felt, well, you know what, here's a guy who I'm always saying that compelling people don't go into public service. We don't have enough compelling individuals who really t are willing to go through what is an incredibly bruising experience to serve the country. And I thought, um, the least I can do is take some of my free time and my weekends uh, to volunteer to, to help out wherever I can, um, with the assumption that he, was, he still had different issues that he wanted to explore and that maybe my advice might actually be helpful in some way, shape, or form. Whereas I knew that Hillary Clinton had very pretty settled views when it came to foreign policy because they'd been in, in uh, the White House for so long. Um, and so at the beginning it was a fair amount of, um, I worked on East Asia and South Asia and so we put together a little team um, of folks. We would get requests from the campaign if things came up, you know, there was something that happened in Korea and should we get a statement out and what should it say and so um, we had a little group there were about three or four of us it was really nice very cozy and we just dealt with everything that came our way and we pretty much take a guess and try to figure out what we thought was the right thing to do and they would take that work and that helped build kind of his profile and some of the foreign policy issues and then of course as his candidacy continued and it became looked more and more promising that group grew and grew and grew to the point that it became I mean we probably had 150 people working in different subgroups on different issues um, and then at, at a certain point it turns into as you well know the just the campaign mechanism itself and so a lot of the people who were originally foreign policy advisors started getting on the phone to do phone banking and doing weekend door knocks and fundraising and all that stuff so at a certain point it became less foreign policy and more just support for the candidate so you have um, a really interesting challenge in your personal life because your husband worked for Senator Clinton, then Sen Senator Clinton, while you were working for the president's campaign, right? Yes. And you have so, two small children, and yet right. you're working 80 to 100 hours a week. How do you balance all, all of that successfully? It's very hard, it turns <laughs> out. <laughs> oh, we were talking about that earlier. I, um, it's, it's very challenging. I, I will not 
uh, lie. And when I first, um, I hadn't actually thought that I would go back into government because I'd served in the, in the government for 10 years before and then gone into the private sector. And I thought, even during the transition, I thought, I just want to help out, you know, help get settled in any way that I can. And I really thought I've got two young kids. I'm not sure that I really can manage going back into government. But um, I felt that uh, the country was really at a crossroads and that the country that my kids would inherit, that, the, that it was important for to try to contribute the little bit that I could to try to turn things into a positive direction because we were at such a pivotal moment. And that probably meant more to the quality of my kids' lives than me being there 100% of the time, which is, I wasn't there 100% of the time, but before that, but a fair, much more percentage of the time. So now I'd say it's, um, my husband is incredible support mechanism. He really is a huge supporter of this job and everything that it takes. He fills in a lot. We have a lot of help from family and friends. Um, and when I'm home, the one thing that I'd say we're quite good about is, um, you know, people take time to spend time with their families, particularly when people are getting close to burnout, because you can burn out in these jobs very easily. And um, the president all the way down, a lot of people have kids, people understand if you need to leave to go to your parent-teacher conference, people are understanding of that, and we just kind of make do. And so it's a challenge, but we've managed to pull it off so far. Okay. You spoke, uh, you gave a speech at the Women to Watch Awards last year, and you said something I found fascinating. Uh, it's amazing what's available online. I was just going to say, really? That's you said online? You, you gave some advice uh -huh. to all the young women there. And one of the pieces of advice you gave was follow the people, not, not the job description. What did you mean by that? I mean that um, particularly when you're starting out in your career, um, what I found is that you have a lot of young people who get excited about the title of the job and um, what they think that will convey but that you learn an incredible amount by working for somebody who's really good. Even if you're not maybe in the most senior job that you could get, maybe if it doesn't make as much money as you possibly could make, that you end up learning an incredible amount from those uh, people and it's worth it to take that risk um, to work for somebody really great. You'll, you just end up learning an incredible amount about whatever field it is that you're in. You meet tons of people and you see what, what great um, great thought leaders, what great leadership is all about if you work for people like that. And I've been lucky in, the, in that regard. And um, I think a lot of young people get um, attracted just to either a fantastic salary, the most money they possibly can make, or the best title they possibly can get, and find themselves pretty miserable pretty quickly. So. Let's move to talk about some of the, the problems the president has to deal with on an everyday basis. There's been a lot of talk about tension with the Afghan government, with President Karzai. Mm -hmm. um, Seeing the two presidents on TV last night, there didn't appear to be a lot of tension. Are they making some progress in their discussions this week? Yeah, yeah. I think the, um, the visit was a productive one. And I think, um, you know, it's interesting. This, as, as they said, which, you know, the press corps doesn't necessarily want to listen to, but it's true. It is a complicated situation, obviously, in a complex relationship. And while we don't see eye to eye on every single thing, and we have a lot of really important differences, on the other hand, we share the same strategic objective. And so I think the visit was helpful in that, um, you know, it's always good to have people come and spend some time, extended time, not just with the president one-on-one, -on -one, although that also is important, but also just the teams together and get everybody to, to air their issues and talk through where we think things are headed and what the priorities are. And I, the, it usually, I'm, I'm glad it was a productive trip, and I think you need to do that every once in a while to kind of reset things and, and allow everybody to talk through, through the issues that we're facing. And obviously, this is a really important, critical element of our national security strategy. So we've got to get it right. Uh, is the administration still confident that we can achieve our objectives over there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do, actually. I think to the extent, I mean, one of the challenges that we inherited, which, you, um, which people have, are well aware of, is that our very strong view that um, before we came into office, this was a neglected and under, um, underfunded and undermanned uh, effort and really truly central to U.S. national security, um, which is why the president's made the decisions that he has, unpopular as they are with some quarters, um, including of his supporters, um, because we can't um, afford to fail, really, in this endeavor. And so I think that um, 
We have some important tests coming ahead in terms of the efforts in Kandahar and elsewhere in the country. And, um, but the notion that of, of our plan and uh, what General McChrystal has laid out in terms of his plan, we feel confident that we can, we can prevail and that we ultimately can achieve our objective in Afghanistan along the timetable that he's talked about. So um, obviously, you know, there'll be ups and downs along the way. But so far, things have been going, I think we've just spending a lot more time focused in on this as a priority, national, national priority with the resources and attention that it really needs in order to be successful. So. The President's nominated um, Ms. Kagan to be the, the next member of the Supreme Court. Uh, kind of tell us what was behind that nomination and, and how you see the confirmation process playing out over the next few yeah. weeks. So um, I think, you know, the President was obviously looking for somebody who's uh, brilliant which she is. Um, I think that she has proven in her job as Solicitor General, she's an incredibly um, thoughtful person. I think he, he obviously was looking for somebody who um, could help shape the direction of the court. Um, she's um, pragmatic, a consensus builder. I think with a lot of difficult issues that come before the court, somebody who can um, help shape in the intra, in the dynamic within the Supreme Court, really shape and lead in, in uh, the direction of the court. And so I think that was a compelling factor. Um, in terms of the, and obviously he's worked closely with her because she's been the Solicitor General now for a year and a half. Um, and in terms of the confirmation process, so far, um, you know, she started her Hill visits. Um, they typically take folks up and you go office by office, I think. Um, at the end, Sotomayor had done uh, 92 office visits by the time she was done. I'm not sure, at a certain point, everybody wanted to meet with her. I'm not sure that'll be the same with Elena. I'm sure she hopes that that isn't the case because that's, that's a lot of visits. Um, but uh, I think everybody is expecting, and we certainly expect that we'll have the hearings before the end of the August recess, and I don't, I don't expect that we'll have any major issues. Um, but obviously, people are going to question her quite quite directly, and I think um, we're expecting that, and that's the, way it should, that's the way it should go. The headlines today are focusing, not just literally today, but over the last several days, have focused very heavily on the crisis in Greece, mm -hmm. on the challenges that Britain faces with such a huge debt. I'm sure there are a lot of our guests here and a lot of Americans who are wondering, what, what's the President's attitude about the growing federal deficit, deficit. and what's he going to do about that? Yeah. So obviously we're very, um, you know, we're concerned, we're certainly in the Europe situation, we're watching that very closely because um, although the direct relationship between what happens in Greece and the United States is somewhat distant, um, the economic recovery here is still quite fragile and so to the extent that the European situation slows European growth, that could become a, a drag on what is our nascent recovery and so we're watching that very carefully. But in terms of the deficit, obviously we have a, um, this is something that we grapple with quite a bit. Um, and part of the reason why we uh, launched a bipartisan commission to look at deficits um, that's just started its work, um, which we had hoped had been, would be legislated and ended up, we ended up doing by executive uh, authority instead since we couldn't get the legislation passed. But we do have a profound issue in, that we have to grapple with as Americans, which is that um, everybody wants to cut the deficit and everybody wants to cut spending until it comes to their issue that they don't necessarily want cut. And so um, thus far, we've been in a situation, I think, where everybody agreed that the immediate priority was to avoid an economic meltdown, which we were on the cusp of having, and that um, we had to throw a lot at that um, in order to keep us from going over the brink. I think that was um, you know, not popular for in a variety of quarters, including uh, among Democrats and including among the president's supporters, but he felt and we felt it's something we absolutely had to do. But there is a time when the economy is clearly rebounding where we have to step back and say, okay, what are we gonna deal, do to deal with our long-term structural deficit, which is not the Recovery Act and the stimulus, but that's a little minor blip on the radar screen, but some of these really profound issues which are, have to do with spending, entitlements, and revenue, all of that um, are issues that we're going to have to work through. And so we're hopeful that the Deficit Commission will come up with some consensus issues and start a dialogue that we can, so we can start to move to that and have the debate inside the country about what do we want our government to do, how do we want to pay for it, and if we want to cut things, what do we want to cut and how do we want to cut them. So it's a, quite, a, quite a daunting task, but it's something we're going to have to have to tackle. 
There's a lot of things going on in politics that are just amazing right now. Tony. Scott Brown winning in Massachusetts. Yes. It looks like Senator Specter could very well lose, lose. his primary next yep. week. You had Congressman Mollahan being denied mm -hmm. renomination. You had <coughs> Senator Bennett in Utah. How do you mm -hmm. read all of this, and, and what's your assessment of the midterm elections? That's so uh, I think that it's pretty clear that the mood is anti-incumbent <laughs> mood. Um, and I think there's this, um, I think a lot of the frustration and the anger you're seeing is some of the same impulses that actually propelled Obama into office, which is people are feeling frustrated that, um, that the government and Congress are are maybe not, don't have the same priorities or are not focused on the issues that Americans want them to focus on. And so um, you do have a really strong anti-incumbent mood. And I don't think, a lot of people like to make parallels to 94. I'm not sure that it's the same kind of parallel. Um, and it is, it's hard to know exactly how, how things are going to work out. And the, the, the history traditionally is that the party in power will lose seats, and I'm sure that, that probably will be the case. But I think there's um, a mood out there that is uh, very strong against people who've been serving in Congress for a very long time. And the kind of things that made people vote, I was listening to an interview with, uh, with Bennett the other night, and he was saying that traditionally the things that people uh, liked about their elected officials, that there was bridge building and compromise, or that you were able to bring home the bacon, as it were, for projects in the district that vote, at least in Utah, the primary um, folks were kind of really against that, that that has become a real negative. And so um, it's, it's, I, I think it, it's going to be a tumultuous period. Um, and also, obviously, the economy will have a lot to do with it as well. I think um, the economy, it looks like it's headed in the right direction. We certainly hope that that's the case. It's fragile at this point, but it seems to be headed in the right direction. And that could have a lot to do with how the mood shifts. So it's a long time between now and November, as you well know. Um, and so it's hard to predict exactly, but there is a stirring out there. You can see it. You can see it in these primary races. It's a little tough to predict what, the, what it'll be like by the time October yeah. rolls around. It's almost I mean, unprecedented. It really is unprecedented. And so, um, and it's interesting because initially I think a lot of commentators saw this as a democratic issue related to healthcare and the like, but I think it's, it's much deeper rooted than that. It's a stronger kind of anti-incumbency mood that's out there. And the president has often stated his admiration for President Reagan in the sense that he viewed Reagan as somebody changed the arc of history, and he said, that's what I want to do as president. Mm -hmm. Does he still have an opportunity to make that his legacy? Um, you know, I'd argue that he's already, already accomplished a fair amount that makes him, this is an, an historic time, um, and uh, we have taken some historic action um, beyond just health care. We've um, done a variety of legislative accomplishments under, over the last year and a half, and we're on the cusp of really profound um, reform to our banking and financial regulatory system. Um, we've done children's health care, we've done Lilly Ledbetter, we've done a landmark public lands bill. Um, there's been a series of um, really elements that have changed the direction of the country, we think, in, in for the better. and. Um, and you know we're obviously getting ready to do the START treaty and the like, and so I think that um, you know history will be history. History will judge everyone, and I think, but I think the notion that Reagan, to the extent that Reagan had a vision for how he saw the country, what he wanted for the country, and really pursued that kind of doggedly, in that sense, he's got some similar characteristics. He does have a vision for what he thinks the promise of the country is. <coughs> and what its potential is that's really optimistic, which is why, and I think that Reagan had that characteristic that's really appealing to people. And I think Obama has a similar personal characteristic. Always seeing what is the possible and what the promise and the opportunity is, even when the country's going through a difficult period as we are right now. You mentioned earlier he's very disciplined. Yes. Tell us about that a little bit. <laughs> um, I was saying earlier, he's very disciplined. Um, I worked for President Clinton, too, so I'm, this is... And President Clinton was not always on time, um, as many people know. Um, uh, he's um, disciplined in that he is... Um, he's a really good, very thoughtful decision maker. Um, he's disciplined about how he uses his time. He's disciplined personally. He's very conscious of, um, you know, 
what kinds of decisions, the import of these decisions. He's very um, thoughtful about how he wants to get uh, the, the input from others. Uh, he's a really collaborative thinker, and so I was saying before that he, if he feels like a conversation, he comes into a meeting, on the one hand, of course, he wants to have collaborative discussion back and forth, but if it becomes clear in, in the beginning of the meeting that um, you know, the issue really hasn't been thought through very well, and people, it's not even clear exactly what, we're, what it is that we're talking about, he may say, well, you know what, it, this obviously is not ready to, for me to make a decision. And he'll say, you know, why don't you come back to me when, we're read, when you're ready to have a more focused conversation about what the issue is at hand. And so I think um, it's important quality at this particular time because you could get swamped on every single issue that we touch during the day. You could spend your entire day on if you really wanted to. Um, and so you have to be very, in a way, miserly and really focused, laser focused on how you use your time every day so that you're getting the maximum bang for the buck, so that the information that you're getting is getting to him in a way that he can digest it, um, give guidance back, have that be crisp, have it be clear, and then make it clear what it is that needs to be done. And he's very good at that, very clear about what he wants. He's very good about making decisions. Also pretty flexible if it turns out the decision situation has changed and we need to change course. He's flexible about you know, being presented with new information and shifting course. So it's, it's, it's I think, a good mix of qualities for somebody who has to oversee such a vast, vast array of uh, issues. Give us a sense of how big of a grind your job is. I mean, how many hours of work? <laughs> how many hours of work are you doing a week? Uh, when do you get? When do you go in? When do you, you get, get home? That yeah. sort of stuff. So I was saying before. So I our first meetings uh, usually get in around seven. Our first meetings at seven thirty, um, and then I'm in back to back meetings. Uh, I'd say every half and twenty minutes to half an hour, back to back until about eight o'clock at night, eight thirty. Um, then I go home and I eat and put the kids' lunches together and put out their clothes and all that. And then I usually get back on the Blackberry around 10 and I do about an hour's worth of work, hour and a half or so. Um, and uh, that's Monday through Friday. And then on Saturdays we usually have a planning meeting that's a two, hour, two hours or three hours during the day on Saturday, which is a really for looking further ahead down the calendar to see kind of what's, what's looming several months ahead. Um, and so uh, I guess I haven't even counted up how many hours that is, but it's a lot of hours. <laughs> and um, uh, and it, is, it is quite a grind. Um, the, the hardest part about it is not the time so much, because you get used to that. Um, the issue that's difficult is that at least the colleagues that we work with in the Chief of Staff's office, we're working on such a sheer range of issues. And you have to get very, very deep into those issues to really understand what it is you're dealing with. So I may go from questions of, uh, you know, NASA rocket design question and how that affects the long-term budget and, and what that might mean for, I don't know, the workforce or technology kinds of decisions, budget decisions, and leap from that into, um, the counter-narcotics mission within the Department of Homeland Security vis-a-vis -vis, and cartel violence vis-a-vis -vis Mexico and hop from that into uh, the housing problem and the foreclosure crisis and what kind of programs we might be working on and hop from that. To, so it's, it's that you have to deep, dig really deep into an issue and then immediately hop to something else that's as complicated and as detailed. That's what gets to be hard and grinding about it during the day. So by the end of the week, I'm usually quite exhausted. Friday morning, 7.30 meeting, a little tough for everybody. People are usually at that point kind of dragging and when Rom goes around and says, does anybody have anything to add? You're kind of like, nope, I don't have anything to say. I'm just sitting here with my coffee, just trying to make it through the next 45 minutes. So. <laughs> well, I'm going to open it up to uh, questions and answers and hopefully if uh, technically we can pull this off, we're going to take some questions from uh, Hanson Hall as well. But I do want to pose one final question to you. Sure. I was delighted to see that uh, even though we're during finals week, so many students could join us That's today. Great. And I was wondering, what advice would you have for uh, our students here who attend events at the Dole Institute who want to go out and make a difference and who in 20 years want to be where you are today? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say don't hesitate to jump in to the fray. Um, I've met so many young people who um, are interested in 
public service or interested in serving and maybe even interested in politics. And I always tell them, and they have great careers and they've got great jobs lined up. And I always say, you know what, go, go work on a campaign, get your hands dirty. Go, this is the time in your life when you're young, you want to work overseas, you know, join the Peace Corps, go work in a refugee camp, go work on a campaign. Really get out there and see what this is all about because um, it's hard to go through your whole life without getting really rolling up your sleeves and seeing what this is all about. Sometimes you learn things, you find out, you think you're really interested in, you know, uh, African public health issues and maybe you go to Africa and you work on those issues and you realize really quickly, you know what, I'm not that interested in that and that's really good to learn early on rather than spending your whole career thinking that's what you want to do and then later realizing maybe not. Um, and so I think um, these days it's sometimes hard, I think, to get off of because young people are so focused on kind of what they're going to do next to just really take the time when you have the ability to do it before you have families, before you have lots of things that you're tethered to, to just get out there and try to just get out there and do whatever it is you think interests you and let your life take you on the path that it'll lead you. Um, because it, it's, it's, it's hugely compelling to do that stuff early, early in your career. Terrific. Okay, we're ready for some Q&A. Uh, Tyler, we have one right. What? Okay, and we got one right here too. Hi, uh, it's a really great honor to have you here today at the University of Kansas, big fan. I've been really following the financial regulation package and I wanted to know a little bit more about the process mm -hmm. going on, especially sort of the conflict about derivatives and how the bipartisan negotiation is going on that. Uh -huh. So um, we were laughing because I was like, oh, I wonder if I'll get a derivatives question. They said, no, you're not going to get any derivatives questions. So, but I appreciate that, yeah. So um, what's going on right now? So I would say what's going on right now is um, one of the most intensive lobbying efforts that I've seen, that we have witnessed, which is kind of going on behind the scenes, um, but not so much behind the scenes, which is um, various elements of Wall Street desperately trying to weaken this bill. Um, at the same time that you have lots of people trying to strengthen the bill. And what I will say about derivatives is that, um, and I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere, people trying to, I'd say generally what the, the, con the, the architecture of the bill is basically set. And so the question is really, um, people are attempting to carve people out and or do things where it looks like it's a strong amendment, but in fact, underneath the way it's written, carves out a bunch of people or weakens, the, in fact, what would otherwise be a really strong regulatory system. So I'd say we're, we're kind of um, cops on the beat, watching every move that people are trying to make, assessing all of the amendments that are coming up. And on derivatives in particular, I think, um, you know, the big issue for us, it's a strategic issue, is we want to make sure that if the financial industry is, is um, wherever they're active, what, whoever it is. It doesn't matter who you are in the financial in industry you are. It matters what it is that you're doing. And if you are controlling and managing a significant chunk of change in an area, hundreds of billions of dollars that's not regulated, we want to get all of that out into the shadows. And that's what the derivatives fight is really about, is whether or not um, the current kind of package whether or not that in fact pushes a lot of the derivatives trading back into the shadows or whether or not it brings it fully under regulatory scrutiny because we don't want to leave lots of big elements of the industry outside of the regulatory umbrella because that's what got us into trouble in the first place. And so um, there's a lot of debate about the derivatives, the current um, language, whether or not in fact it does that pushes things out of the regulatory oversight or whether or not it brings it further in. And so, um, there's been a lot of back and forth on that, and there's going to continue to be, and there are going to be a bunch of other amendments. And I'd say in the next week, by the, you know, the next several days, um, you're going to see a lot of ramp up of this because um, we're getting to the end of this uh, end of this line. So expect lots more activity on it. Okay, Jen. Said that you were um, the part of your portfolio was the British Petroleum issue in the Gulf. Yeah, I'm working on an element. We, actually, I was. Yeah, I'll let you finish your question, but yeah. Well, I, I, I've, been, I've been following it, and, and it just breaks my heart to see the, you know, an entire um, industry pretty much wiped out. 
And it looks like on the news that um, British Petroleum cannot be held liable for as much as maybe they should be held liable for. And I'm wondering, is there anything going on behind the scenes that you can talk about that we don't know um, to uh, mitigate the damage that's being done down there? Mm -hmm. um, I was, I was uh, just going to comment that, yes, I'm one of many people uh, in the White House who's touching the oil spill. I, I think it's actually, of all the issues we've worked on so far, it's the one that's touching the most elements of the White House because you have everybody from our science team who's focused on the engineering of how to stop the leak to obviously the people who work on the environmental type issues. We have our domestic policy people working on the economic impact for fishermen and small businesses and that. We have obviously the uh, economic people working on the impact to the markets. It's our legal counsel, the Coast Guard's involved as the incident commander, so our national security people are involved. It's, it's literally touching elements of the entire complex in various ways. And, um, you know, the, what BP has said, and we believe we're holding them to this, is that they will pay all legitimate claims um, under the Exxon Valdez, after the Exxon Valdez spill. Um, it made it very clear that they are responsible for the environmental cleanup of the spill. There's no question about that, um, and that's an unlimited amount of damages. So at the end of all of this, after the Coast Guard is done renting trawlers and we're doing the chemical dispersants and the cleanup on the shore, we'll hand over a bill to BP, and whatever that is, that's, that's what they're going to pay. The, the question of liability gets to the economic damages, which is to the fishermen and obviously any other industries that may be affected, secondary and tertiary. And so far, the, the, um, the CEOs of BP, they've been, they testified, I think, yesterday and the day before that, and when pressed on this question, they said they would pay all legitimate claims and recognize that that may be beyond the $75 million. They paid, I think, about three or four thus far out in claims. And so we're, they've said it, and we're, we're expecting that that's the case. Um, and I think people are going to, since they said it, that people are going to hold them accountable to that. Um, and we certainly hope there's no reason to believe that they wouldn't be, that they're not being honest about that. So, but obviously we're going to continue to push that to the extent we can. Go ahead, Julia. First, thank you so much for coming today. It's a real honor to have you here, okay. especially for those of us who are young women wanting to go into politics. That's great. It's really great. Thanks for um, having me. <laughs> my question is actually about what inspired you to go into the Foreign Service, and if you feel that the time that you worked in embassies abroad has helped you to juggle the issues that you do on a daily basis now. Um, what inspired me to go into the Foreign Service? You know, it, uh, I worked for, when I was at Mount Holyoke, I, was, I studied international relations, and I studied Chinese, and I went abroad my junior year and studied Chinese, and um, when I came back, I, uh, I was kind of torn between advertising, which I worked in, and um, foreign policy, which is kind of a weird mix. Um, <laughs> I, admittedly, strange mix. Uh, but I worked for a guy then, Tony Lake, who was a professor at Mount Holyoke, who then later became National Security Advisor under President Clinton. And I remember him saying to me, at the time, um, we had the, the civil war in El Salvador was going on, and I didn't agree with the policy in El Salvador. And, um, I had taken the Foreign Service exam at the behest of, of him and a, a couple of other professors. And I thought, well, I just can't join the Foreign, foreign Service because I, you know, I don't agree with our policy in El Salvador. And I remember Tony saying to me, um, then don't go to El Salvador. You know, there's a big world out there. <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah, that's a good point, actually. <laughs> and so I really, I've, I'd always been really interested in international issues. And so... Um, when the opportunity arose, I was surprised that I passed the exam. I literally was serious about it, but not that serious about it. Um, and once I passed the written exam, I thought, well, gee, maybe this actually could be a future of mine, because I actually passed this exam. What a stunning, what a stunner. So, um, and so I decided to do it, and I decided to do it. I thought, well, you know, I'll do it for two years and see how it goes. And two years later, four years and four years, and the next thing you know, it was almost 10 years. Um, and along the way, it was the best job for somebody like me who loves to learn different issues all the time, work on a range of different topics. So I did East Africa policy and human rights and Southeast Asia and the Balkans and things at the UN and the White House. So for me it was great because I could dabble, but it, it was within a, an organized construct of a, of a career. And so, um, and did the NSC prepare me for this job? Absolutely. Um, because one of the 
central issues that we do at the White House is navigate the equities of the government. Unlike the private sector, which usually has a bottom line, usually making money or selling a product or whatever, whatever it is that they do, everybody's kind of rowing in the same direction. Um, in government, it's really different, which is you realize very quickly that there are legitimate equities that everybody has, usually on an issue. And it's, there's no perfect answer. You're always assessing the downsides. And I think nowhere is that clearer in policymaking than in foreign policy. Um, and so, and nowhere is the interagency process and all the different interests across the broad government as um, strong and palpable as in the foreign policy arena. And so I think it, it, it really uh, shaped my view about how government works, um, gave me access to a really broad range of issues. I got used to the pace. So coming into the White House this time, I knew right away kind of what the pace was, how the work flows, who's going to care about what. You see an issue for the first time, you already know, is it going to be controversial? Is it relatively easy? Who's going to care about this? And so it's been that early experience was hugely instrumental in this, because otherwise it, it, it definitely would be a daunting task to learn the whole federal government. So. Okay. A question right here. Hello. How are you? Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm a longtime Lawrence and a Kansas resident, born in the state. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me. One of the, uh, I guess the question I have is that uh, I'm uh, retired, semi-retired, because I'm still working but I'm uh, drawn full Social Security and Medicare. And the thing that uh, the Obama administration has done to me is going to cost me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And that is you have costed me a lot of money with you're taking my Medicare advantage away from me with this health care bill. And uh, I, I think that's the wrong tack because mm -hmm. you're going to cost me a lot more money for, for the, the uh, Social Security, not the Social Security, but the Medicare and uh, Part D and the whole thing. You're costing me a lot more money than what I was paying before. Well, I actually, I mean, I don't want to get into the details of Medicare Advantage because I don't know exactly how the plan is being rolled out. But, I mean, my, um, my understanding of how the implementation is working is that they're actually working on ways to make sure the Medicare Advantage, that it is phased in, that people aren't on the hook. We have a, uh, an increased amount that's going to seniors to help offset the increased cost to the extent that, it, that they're there. And so it's, I mean, uh, there are, for every place in the Medicare, in the medical system, um, there were both lots of places where we were paying extra subsidies to, to, um, to companies, um, and lots of places in the, in the medical system that, uh, that were kind of inefficient. And so we've taken a lot of places and tried to even out those expenses. And so places, some people may be paying more in certain kinds of things, but also saving money elsewhere. And so, um, all I would say is, is that I think you need to wait and see how it's implemented because I think there's a lot of misinformation about how it's actually going to affect people individually and a lot to do with how individual states are going to set up various pools and how people are going to participate in them and things are going to get rolled out over the next six or seven years. So it's going to be a long time before everything kicks in. Um, so I just encourage you to have an open mind as we work through the implementation of this because I think overall our view was that this is a our medical system, our healthcare system, which is a sixth of the entire economy, was kind of on an unsustainable track um, in a variety of ways. And um, people that we needed to deal with that underlying problem, both for because of our fiscal reasons, but also just because we had an unsustainable system in which everybody's bearing the cost. If you have insurance, you're bearing the cost of it. Um, for people who don't have insurance, um, you know, people are paying for lots of procedures they don't need, things are, you know, the expenses were kind of out of control. And so, um, you know, we really feel that the health care bill will, will help stabilize the entire system, bring down costs over the long haul. Um, and so the implementation will take many, many months. And so I don't want you to prejudge how it's going to affect you individually until we're toward the end of that, of that line. Okay. Other questions? I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to thank you for coming, too. Um, needless to say, you're the highest ranking government official I've ever spoken to. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about Iran. I was wondering, do you think that there are any viable alternatives to either a military strike or it, the sanctions package that the Obama administration has been working on for the, the last year 
to a country that is so seemingly unresponsive to any sort of outside influence. I mean, they've been pushing forward with this full steam ahead, trying to get a nuclear weapon. I was just wondering, do you think Americans need to start preparing, them, preparing themselves for a world in which Iran has, has nuclear weapons capability in, in the next five to ten years? Well, obviously this is a top priority for the administration to, to make sure that that isn't the case. And I think um, the thing that's been laid bare in the last however many months uh, whereas when we entered the, when we took office, I think it was unclear in a, in a strange way we had become, um, we didn't have the support of all of these other countries to realize that this was in fact a really serious threat. And the internal fractures inside Iran have made, I think, this risk even greater. And so I think the, the um, it's a really obviously serious issue and the encouraging thing is that for, I think for the first time we're getting a lot more cooperation from the other countries, which we need in order to really have a long-term solution to this. So um, it is a huge risk, obviously, to the region, to the stability of the region, to all of our interests in the Middle East. And so, um, you know, people are spending an incredible amount of time to try to move Iran into the, into the right direction. And while we, while we may not have a lot of direct influence with the Iranians, obvi for obvious reasons, it's not to say that there aren't other powers who do. And so. Part of it is they're, they're not totally impervious to outside influence. And so um, that's really been our task, which is to make sure whatever we end up with that everybody uh, imposes it together. Because if we do it by ourselves, obviously it's got limited, limited impact. Thank you. Hold it down. Are you hold it? OK. Uh, <clears throat> in his State of the Union speech, he mentioned that he's going to keep America second to none. Okay. What he's talking and thinking, discussing, and concrete plan for it. Second, is a congratulation to his election as president. It's one of the greatest decisions American people made. And personally, I didn't support him. One of the reasons is when I watch him dumping his old friend, Reverend Wright and Bill Air. Instead of dumping them, he should mediate between mainstream of society and these alter activist groups. Third, why I'm is sorry, he so you, really? I'm just going to use first this. Question. Yeah, let's just ask one. Everybody just gets <laughs> one question. I'm I sorry. So you ask the question that you want her to answer. Just one, sir. Why is he reluctant to agree with the FTA to South Korea, Panama, and Colombia? Are you talking about the, the, the free trade agreements? Right. Oh, okay. Um, so, I mean, it, actually, part of the issue with the free trade agreements is that um, we've been in a negotiation with all three countries to work on various elements of the package, and this is, um, we want to be able to get those ready. He's a supporter of free trade. And the question is whether or not we, with the Koreans in particular, we're in an ongoing negotiation about the nature of the package. Um, and so, and the same with Colombia, there are some issues that we and the Colombians have been on discussing on an ongoing basis to try to deal with some of the human rights issues that are associated with the package. And so, um, I wouldn't say that there's, there's a holdup per se, but those negotiations are ongoing as well as the Doha round. And so, um, I think it's fair to say that in, the, the, uh, the multilateral trade regime we certainly think is really an important element because that's where you get a lot of the benefits for American exporters and producers and the like. Um, and, and multilateral nego trade negotiations take quite a long time uh, to come to fruition. And so, and various countries are more enthusiastic or less enthusiastic as a, particularly with the recession. So. Um, it's going to be, it's, it's just going to take some time in order to get them ready in order to be able to pursue them. But he's a supporter of free trade. So. Tyler, you did, did a good job very skillfully negotiating your way through the crowd for another On question over here. Um, I was wondering, do you think that passage of health care will help or hurt the Democrats in the coming midterm elections? Um, I think it'll help. Um, in part because I think... Um, to the extent that people were worried that somehow everything was going to change overnight and that everybody was going to lose their doctor and that the whole, the sky would come falling down, that that's not 
really going to happen. Um, and I think that the kind of, it was obviously a very uh, intense period in the lead up to the, to the bill, passage of the bill itself. Um, but I think there are a lot of other issues that are also pressing on people's minds, the economy, um, that getting better. And I think a lot of the, the prospects in the midterm have to do with factors that are different. Um, the conversation, I think, will be different by the time the fall comes around. And um, you're already starting to see that a little bit in the polling, that people are, kind of, people are worried about the, the things that are happening right now, whether it's oil spills or the uh, recession or um, small business credit and that kind of thing. So I think those are the kinds of issues that are going to be on people's minds in the, in the lead up. Okay. Where are mics? Okay, here we go. The uh, Economic Recovery Act, or stimulus bill, has gotten a bad rap. We have politicians in this state going around saying it's, it's actually created no jobs, or maybe even uh, reduced the number of jobs. I guess they don't think that teachers and firemen and policemen are, are jobs, too. In fact, there are things on this campus that people don't realize are a result of this bill, including a new engineering building that was ground, ground was broken the other day. 80% of the money is coming from the stimulus bill. It wasn't mentioned by anybody at the ceremony or in the paper. What happened? I mean, this, this, this bill did a tremendous amount of good for our economy, uh, and, and the, and the so-called narrative has been that the Republicans have pursued has, has, has got whole. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, one of the one of the challenges is that people. It's true that Americans generally don't know what was in the stimulus, and realizing that you know a third of the stimulus was actually in tax cuts, home buyer tax credit. There's a for um, college tuition. There was making work pay, which was a tax cut that affected probably everybody in this room because 95 percent of working Americans got a tax cut. Um, and then a third of it was things like support for, to keep teachers from being laid off and firefighters and to help with um, food stamps and um, unemployment insurance and allowing people to stay on their health insurance and all of that. So that was another third. And then the last third were the kind of projects that you're referring to, which are the kind of infrastructure, construction kind of projects. Um, and it's true. We've seen this notion that we see it a lot where... Um, uh, lawmakers who voted, who were vehemently opposed to the Recovery Act will show up for the ribbon cutting um, and claim all kinds of credit for the very project that they presumably didn't want to have happen. Um, and so goes the nature of American politics in some ways. And I think, um, you know, it is, it has been a messaging challenge because people, I think the Recovery Act in, in many ways is, you know, nobody wants to write a huge check like that in order to keep the economy going off, off over the cliff. On the other hand, I think most economists would now say that it's the very thing, part of the reason that the economy is bouncing back and other economies are struggling is that we really did move very forcefully and very quickly and in a really strong way so that the market's people felt like, okay, it's not going to be all, uh, all um, unraveling right before us. And so um, it is a challenge, but I think over time, and Granted, you know, the, the, over time people are already, and they will continue to, I think, see the benefits of the Recovery Act, both small and large. And um, already we're seeing, it's, it's been interesting, there's, I think, going to be ongoing press coverage about how some of the investments in the Recovery Act have really transformed entire industries in the United States. Um, and... Uh, and I think it may take a while, but I think over time, the way you know, we all see it and the president sees it, which is we made the right decision, we did a good thing in investing and hopefully um, push, leapfrogging a bunch of industries that were otherwise lagging, and um, you know, the proof will be in the pudding, and over time we'll, we'll get credit for it because it was the right thing to do and it worked. So. We have one right here. Okay, Tyler, thank you. On a similar note to the whole BP debacle, what are Obama's near and midterm plans for climate policy and legislation? Mm -hmm. So, um, I think just yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, um, Senators Kerry and Lieberman introduced their um, comprehensive energy bill, um, which is both creates a carbon cre credit trading regime and also has a bunch of different elements, clean energy. Um, 
and uh, you know we're very supportive of the legislation. We hope it passes. Um, unfortunately, Senator Graham, Lindsey Graham, who had been involved in the negotiations all the way through and was really instrumental in coming up with the framework of the bill, dropped off the bill at the last minute. And um, you know, it's unclear its prospects for passage, but it remains one of a really top priority because we believe fundamentally that our energy independence and transforming our use of energy is both essential to our national security, but also to our long-term economy. Um, and lots of other countries are out there moving in a green direction uh, a lot faster than we are, and we need to play catch up if we want to be competitive in the, in the rest of the century. And so um, it's a really high priority for us, and I'm hoping it can get past this still this year. So. Jen, do you have a question? I'm no historian, but I do try to keep up with what's going on as best I can. It just seems to me like this administration has taken on more big issues in such a short period of time than any other administration that I'm aware of. How many more big issues do we have? How many more can we handle? How many more can Congress juggle at the same time? Yeah, well, um I mean, I, a fair number of the big issues we had to tackle were not ones of our choosing, that's for sure. But um, it's true that we have a big agenda because the country has a lot of big issues that we're grappling with, and some of which just can't wait to be dealt with. Um, and the things like, um, you know, Afghanistan, which we felt really needed to be, thank you, really felt that we really felt needed to be uh, a central focus. Um, we're spending a lot of time and attention on that. Obviously, the economy is, is first and foremost in many ways. And, you know, the country has a lot of challenges, and some of them, they just, they really can't wait. And some of them are by our own choosing. I mean, we certainly, in some ways, whether it's, uh, you know, this oil spill or Haiti happens or we have the coal mine disaster, things, big things just happen. And so, um, you know, we have to take those on, but at the same time, I think the president feels really strongly that, um, yes, you have to manage all those issues as they come along, but it's also an obligation to try to move the, the country forward and not always be in reactive mode, but really try to move and invest in the country's future so that 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, our kids and grandkids are inheriting a, a more stable economy, lots of prosperity, good paying jobs, and all the rest, and that we're educating our kids and We've waited a long time to grapple with a lot of these hard problems, and you know the time has come to try to solve them. We have time for one last question. Okay. Thanks. Oops. Thanks again for thanks again for coming. Um, I, I guess piggyback on that last question. How is it? I, I guess maybe uh, maybe offer an example, a micro example, in terms of how all those things you just shared that come up unexpectedly. <laughs> But at the same time, allowing you to continue on, like, for example, I'm very interested in the reauthorization of ESEA and then follow up with IDEA. How does that not get in the way of that very important work and uh, allow for it to, to continue, especially within a timely manner? Yeah. I what mean, are those acronyms? Oh, I ESEA know, so. is the uh, reauthorization of the um, education bill, so okay. No Child Left Behind Act and, the, um, and uh, uh, the core education funding bill. Um, and I have to say that, um, you know, one thing that we feel really lucky about is we have a great cabinet that um, really talented people like Kathleen Sebelius, who is fantastic, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, who are incredibly uh, capable, focused, have great leadership skill, uh, inspiring, and can really drive elements of the agenda. And I think, um, one of the things that I really have enjoyed about this time in government um, is how collaborative everybody is. Um, people are working with each other in ways that I, is not the norm in the executive branch, I think. Um, and we rely on them a lot to keep moving the ball forward uh, on issues when people get overtaken by events. But part of the, I think, the central challenge of, of governing at this level is that there's always urgent, and the challenge is that you can't allow the urgent to outweigh the important every single time. And uh, managing that balance is the essential quality of what we do every day. Um, 
because just because it's not on the front page doesn't mean that it's not an urgent pressing issue for the country. And if that's the case, we just have to summon the ability and the focus and the time in order to solve it, um, or to try to solve it, or to help figure out what, who should solve it. And that's, um, that's the essential element of our, of our job. So yes, it's daunting. Yes, it's, sometimes it's very overwhelming. I sometimes try not to think about how many issues we have on our plate. I don't sometimes know how the president does it every day when he wakes up and something else happens. I mean, when this oil spill happened, I mean, you know, it's like we literally can't get a break. Um, and, but that's just life, and you have to dig in and hope that you can, you can navigate it to the best outcome. Um, that's basically the job. So we manage it somehow. Mona, thank you so much for coming to the Dole Institute. Thank you. We really appreciate thank you. it. Thank you.